Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining. Welcome to our first uh, session on um, a new Sunday school theme, a theme of uh, Kingdom of God. It's a gorgeous day outside, and uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> we're going to uh, start on this theme today, and um, I'm going to try to keep it on the shorter side than last time, so a little bit of the feedback that I got. 90% of it from my wife, actually 100% from my wife, is that the, the topics were kind of too long and involved and she thought I should cut it shorter and extend the session. So um, I think this will go into next year, probably February or uh, February or March. And uh, I'll be recording and somewhere along the line, I, I trust that we will be meeting face to face at least in partial stages. And so what uh, these sessions will be recorded so that people who are at church um, can view it if they like uh, later on. So um, I wanna start off asking, why, why did I find, choose this particular theme? Um, I had a personal interest in this particular theme and the kingdom of God, because whenever I, I, I turn to the scriptures or read various theological works, uh, the kingdom theme comes to uh, comes out quite frequently. And uh, when I was in seminary, we didn't really talk that much about the kingdom. Um, and it seemed to me to be a very significant and important uh, topic. And so I've been looking at it on and off uh, at various times through the last few years. And then the last uh, two months or so, I've been reading up on it a little bit more. And I felt that it was more relevant for us as a church and as an individual more than I realized. And so I, I chose this thing because uh, not only for its relevance, but I, I feel like if I understood the kingdom of God in scripture, that I would understand or it would shed light on a number of other different issues. And so as we proceed through this study and as we look at this theme, we'll see its relationship to various other areas of uh, uh, Christian theology. And at the same time as well, um, what we have is, uh, I feel like in order to answer the question, what is the church all about? And, and the question that I've been asking myself for the last few months, uh, what is the calling of new life in, uh, let's say, Silver Spring or Tacoma Park area? I feel like in order to answer that question, I need to first understand what the kingdom is about. So if you remember, when I first came to the church, I preached a sermon on uh, the gospel, uh, community, and then kingdom, those two, three themes. And my central passage, uh, I, I felt like God impressed it upon my heart even before I came, was Matthew 6.33, that uh, we are to seek first his kingdom. Uh, but in order to obviously understand what that means, we have to understand what the kingdom is. And so that's why I kind of picked this theme. It is complicated in, in many ways because there's so many disagreements on how to understand this and its relationship to the other areas of theology. And so while I, I will be presenting a particular view, um, not everyone would agree, certainly in the evangelical world and even within our community, there may be people who disagree. And so we can have a good dialogue in that way. And so for the next 20 minutes or so, um, I just wanna introduce the topic and then we'll move on uh, next week to other areas as well. But just a brief introduction for today. And let's see, we're going to use PowerPoint. Uh, there we go. And so, uh, uh, this is the theme, the kingdom of God, and it is found pretty much all the way through. So this is how I understand the fall, that the fall, Adam and Eve, were created to be uh, vice regents, kings, rulers uh, over God's creation. So it's from the very beginning. And when Adam and Eve ate the fruit, it was sort of insurrection against God, and they lost the kingdom. 
and all in that in that middle area between uh, the Genesis beginning and then toward the end of Revelation, that middle area is God's attempt to regain the kingdom of God. And in fact, a kingdom that is unique from the kingdoms of the world. So there's a, a new work by uh, a Jonathan. Oh, I forgot his last name, but uh, it's a new work where he argues that the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven is not exactly the same thing. So in previous theology, kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven was assumed to be identical, right? Like the, the president of the United States and the White House was the same referent. But he argues, um, Jonathan, Jonathan Pennington argues that the, when the Bible speaks of kingdom of heaven, it's contrasting the nature of the kingdom of God from the nature of the kingdoms of this world, that they have different values, that they're different. And so um, in the middle part between Genesis and Revelation, it's all about regaining the kingdom of God on various stages. And then in the Revelation 21, 22, it's the reattaining of the kingdom. So that when I look at the beginning of the Bible, the middle and the ending of the Bible, it's all about the kingdom uh, of God. And so uh, I think this is a crucial topic and one that I'm personally interested in. And I'm glad you guys are here. And so we can journey together for the next, uh, boy, four months or so, maybe even five, as we look at the various stages and views. Uh, so I just have four brief points. The kingdom of God is arguably the most important topic in all of the Bible. And so that's what I've been doing sort of, but uh, I'll just focus on the gospels, but certainly within Paul's writing as well. And before Christ came, uh, it, it, it's crucial, but I'll focus mainly on the gospels for now. And so you find it connected to the gospel, right? So um, we saw this before in uh, some of the sermons and Bible studies, but now after Jesus, uh, not after John was uh, arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Now I find this fascinating because you know, I've been a Christian since I was 16 years old. I went to uh, Dallas Seminary for four years for a master's of theology and then went to, you know, Trinity for my PhD program. But it wasn't until uh, toward the end of my PhD program and in the beginning of my teaching career at Moody Bible Institute that I suddenly realized that the gospel isn't just about that we are sinners, that God loves us. He sent his son to die for us. If we believe in him, he will take the wrath of God upon himself and we will have eternal life. The gospel is certainly that, but it's more than that. And for all those years, I never attached the kingdom of God to the gospel. And so uh, I'm wondering why is that? Why is it when it's so clear in the lips of Jesus that the gospel is the kingdom of God that we have kind of lost it and I think by losing it, we may have lost a crucial dimension of what Christianity is about, what the church is about, and what our lives should be about. So uh, the kingdom of God is crucial because the gospel is crucial. It's also in the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. So uh, in the beginning, when he started his ministry, he talked about the kingdom of God. Uh, and then it's also found post-resurrection. So after Jesus uh, died, was crucified, you know, buried and rose from the dead, he came back and he spent time with the disciples. And the thing that he taught them was the kingdom of God. So if you look here in Acts 1, 1 to 3, in the book, first book, Theopolis, so this is Luke. He was writing the events of the life of Jesus in Luke, that's part one, and then the, uh, the events of the church in part two, that's Acts. So he's writing to Theophilus, I have dwelt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, perhaps to uh, uh, Timothy with his nail pierced hands, appearing to them 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. This is what Jesus teaches from the very beginning in Mark 1 to the thing that he talks about most after he is resurrected is the kingdom of God. And then we have uh, Paul writing that at the very end of human history, this is what Jesus will do. Uh, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom of God to the Father after destroying every rule and authority and power. 
for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet, and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. This seems to be the purpose of Jesus' coming, is to destroy every rule and authority and power that stands against the kingdom of God, right? Paul says in Ephesians that all things must be submitted under him or summed up in him. And then when he has the kingdom of God and all other kingdoms destroyed, he's going to take the kingdom and present it to the father like a gift to the father. And so I feel like this is Jesus's life purpose is to establish the kingdom and give it to the father as a gift. And then we have John the Baptist who comes, right? We plan for the kingdom of God is at hand so that the ministry of John the Baptist is a preparation for Jesus. And their message is the same, the kingdom of God. And then when Jesus sends out the 12 disciples, right? Uh, go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans. There's a progressive nature to the gospel, right? Luke 1, uh, the power of the gospel goes to Jerusalem and Judea, the Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, verse six, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and proclaim as you go saying, the kingdom of God is at hand. Just within the gospels, it's so pregnated with the kingdom of God theme that you can barely turn a page without it appearing. In fact, uh, if the second most topic Jesus talks about is finances, the number one topic that Jesus talks about in terms of volume of verses dedicated to the topic, it's the kingdom of God. And in fact, a lot of times when you look at the finance, uh, finance aspects of uh, his teaching, it's related to in the context of the kingdom teaching as well. And so I think we have chosen a topic that is crucial, and I pray that it will have a uh, uh, great payoff, I, I don't like the language, but that it would have great reward in devoting our time to this particular theme. Secondly, how we understand the kingdom should inform us as the calling of the church. And I mentioned that in the beginning as well. Uh, what is our church all about? What are we supposed to do? What's our main task? What's our purpose? And I think part of the answer comes in understanding the language of the kingdom throughout scripture. And so what is the mission of the church? And these days, there's been a lot of discussions, as you may be aware of. What is the nature of the church and its particular calling? Different answers have been offered by different segments of the church universal. And so you have books like the Five Views book, where five different themes or emphasis uh, arises as to what the church is all about. Now, there is a both end, right? So uh, the church should be able to reach out um, and serve the community, yet the church should educate its uh, uh, constituents, its congregation. Jesus said, feed my sheep. So there is a both end, but if we pick one thing that the church is, uh, what's, what's the core of the church's calling, and then how the other things we do should support it, then we have different emphasis to what that core or central calling is. In fact, I found this online this week, you know, God is not calling us to go to church. He is calling us to be his church, the hope of the world. And I, I, I fully agree with this statement, but even as I was reading it, I'm thinking, but what does it mean to be his church? And how are we to be the hope of the world? Well, I think it's, embedded within how we understand kingdom language. In fact, I went through five different images. So if I asked you, give me a picture of what you think the church is all about, and you only had one picture you could choose, there are five competing pictures of what the church should be. So uh, first picture would be classroom, and this is school, education. So the church is to educate uh, the members that come what the Bible is teaching. So this would be understanding feed my sheep as feed knowledge teaching to the church. So the model is a teaching model and we're, uh, we have Sunday school we, uh, and the sermons are very teaching oriented. Uh, and so that will be the primary focus and then worship and prayer and outreach and all of that is a secondary supportive like pillars to the image of teaching. And uh, as of now, you know, I've been at this church for eight, nine, oh, no, no, 10, uh, going on my 10th month. And I know the COVID thing has really disrupted 
me trying to get to understand the church and you guys to understand me. But I feel like for us, this is probably our model uh, of our church, whether intentionally or not. We are a very teaching oriented uh, church and that's neither good nor bad. It's just that we should understand that's probably where we stand, at least in my opinion. Uh, and then the second one is a hospital. The primary image is the hospital. And these are churches that are heavily uh, related to, let's say, therapy and counseling so that people who are wounded in the world, uh, they've been abused, uh, uh, they've been neglected, they're lonely, they're struggling in understanding who they are, identity issues. And, and the church is a hospital where they can come and uh, find healing. So healing language is very strong in these kinds of uh, churches. And in healing, they understand who they are in Christ and that they're loved by the Father and the love of the Father should heal them of their past uh, abuses that they receive so that they can go and forgive them, release the bitterness that has accumulated over the years. And so you have very strong therapeutic types of sermons. And, and in these types of churches, they're more open to hosting a, a, a 12 step programs for various different kinds like alcohol or um, uh, gambling and things of that nature. So it's, it's a hospital and then everything else they do would feed into this particular image. The third one is a homeless shelter. Uh, and, and this is a very social responsibility or they would use social justice types of churches. And these churches are more within what we call emergent church models where uh, they, they have understood uh, the fundamentalist movement from the 1920s and 30s to let's say the 1980s has separating uh, the church from sharing the gospel and the church reaching out and fighting against social injustice, that it was separated out between the conservative church and the liberal church. But the emergent church believes that that separation is, uh, is a false dichotomy and that they should be brought together so that there's a strong social movement within these churches. Uh, and so that would be a third picture and everything else that they do is supportive uh, of this. And you will see uh, them carrying out not just uh, you know, missions work going to other countries and running BBS and preaching the gospel, but they will go and uh, build, uh, dig water wells and build uh, uh, homes. You know, these are very uh, social or practical movements. And for them, that's part of missions. You don't just have to share the gospel or plant a church in order to be a missionary. You can be almost a Peace Corps type uh, and still be a church uh, doing missions. The fourth one is boot camp, and this is more like a, a training, so strong type of a discipleship, a discipline, so that we help our congregation members to become warriors uh, who will go out into our society, and a lot of this act revolves around taking back our culture. So uh, the cultural war needs cultural soldiers, and so the church is designed to train them like a boot camp so they will be strong and go out and fight against, uh, uh, let's say, secularism, uh, forces of darkness, uh, liberalism, perhaps, and take over or reconquer some of the culture that uh, has been lost, uh, de-Christianized, if you want to say. And then the fifth one is a welcoming center. And I picked a welcoming center because this would be sort of the Willow Creek model and the Willow Creek Association that has been uh, very popular in the last uh, few decades. And it's like a welcoming center where uh, you know, a number of our church people have uh, abandoned church in their college years, their young adult years. And then when they have uh, children, there's a tendency of wanting to come back. And so Willow Creek does a, a survey. Why, why do we lose so many of our young people at church? Well, partly because the messages are irrelevant, partly because it's boring. And so what they have done is they remodeled their worship service. And I attended Willow Church for three months straight and then at various times so that the sermons are highly re uh, relevant. It speaks right to where their felt needs are. And then they would have drama and professional drama and the music 
uh, professional music and then the drama where they would have like a five, seven minute skit right before the sermon to bring the audience in into uh, the, uh, the sermon, the message before it was preached. And it was highly entertaining, very high quality. And so, uh, and then, you know, there's no cross in the sanctuary. Uh, they remove all the Christian uh, icon. And then on Wednesday and Thursday, believers can go and it's very strongly Christian oriented. But Sunday morning, it's for uh, unbelievers to come and check out Christianity. It's like a welcoming center. Come and find out what we teach and what we're about and meet some people, get your questions answered. There's a cafe that you can go afterwards. And so it's very friendly, seeker friendly oriented. So we have five different pictures and uh, which one should we be? Well, part of the answer comes, I think, from understanding what the kingdom is all about. And so I think it will help us answer this question as we move forward. Third, how do we understand how we understand the kingdom should inform us as to the calling of our life, not just church, but as Christians, we should be seeking the kingdom of God uh, with all of our lives in every area. So uh, I'm getting this from uh, Angela Duckworth, and you may have heard of this, but it, it grit. Uh, it's a TED talk that she gave uh, many years ago and has 7 million uh, hits, but this is Angela Duckworth. And uh, she wrote a book called Grit after her TED talk exploded. And uh, she was a uh, high level administrator, corporate person making good money. And then she felt like she needed to give more back to her community. And so she started teaching seventh grade math. And when I heard that, I, I thought of Jenny, <laughs> seventh grade math. And while she's teaching, what she realized was that the kids that succeed did not necessarily have the highest IQ. They weren't necessarily the quickest thinker. And the more she studied, what she realized is that these kids have passion and they have perseverance. And so what, what she calls a grit. And so what she did was she went to uh, the Naval Academy and to different institutions and she spent time studying uh, what separates successful people from people who kind of fail out or do not succeed? And what she argues is that it's not IQ, really. It's not nature. It's more of grit, how hard you work, how much do you really want it? And she gave this TED Talk for 7 million hits. And so that grit is persistence and passion. And when they come together, then we really work in such a way that we produce results. So this is the formula. Talent and effort, right? So if you have a, a high level of talent and some effort, you get a skill. And so you pick it up pretty quickly. But skill isn't what changes lives or produces results. It's skill plus effort that actually leads to success so that successful people have skill plus effort. Now, uh, I, I'm doing all of this because I want to get to hear what she argues that every person's life ideally should be like this. So you have a number of different goals. So every day I, I, when I get up, I list three or four things I want to get done. But on Sunday night, I list several things I want to get done for the week. And then in the beginning of the new year, I have a couple of major things that I want to get done. So I have, I have a low level goals, medium level goals, but there should be a top level goal, she says, where everything else feeds into it so that my life is about one thing. And I thought, wow, what a great illustration of what my life should be about. It should be about the kingdom. How I understand my role in seeking the kingdom of God should be my top level. And then every other goal that I have should somehow flow into like streams flowing into uh, a, a, a lake that all areas of my life should feed into this top level goal. So, you know, Paul says, whether you eat or drink, glorify God. So if glorify God is my top level, then every other thing that I do, including the most mundane things in life, ought to feed into that. And uh, the kingdom of God, if that is my top level goal, then it should feed into that. And obviously that requires understanding what the kingdom is all about. I, I picked this is because I, I find this story fascinating. This is Rafael Antonio Lozano. And I don't know if you heard of this guy, but uh, <laughs> Starbucks should pay him millions of dollars in uh, advertisement because Lozano's goal is to travel around the world and visit as many Starbucks as possible before he dies. 
So uh, he goes and what he does is he, uh, uh, he visits the Starbucks and then what he does is he goes and he tells them his per what he's doing and then he asks for a complimentary cup of coffee, just a little cup. And then what he does is he goes, drinks some, and then he goes out into the front of the Starbucks and then he takes a picture of himself. Well, he's visited over 9,000 Starbucks. Uh, and th this man has spent $150,000 trying to visit every Starbucks shop in the world. And when I was reading this article, uh, it was fascinating to me. He spends 25% of his total income visiting Starbucks around the world. And there's this one story he tells of how he heard that there were three Starbucks on the Hawaiian Islands that were about to close. And so he bought an airline ticket, flew to Hawaii, and he went to all three of the Starbucks that was closing and did this drinking coffee and then getting his picture shot. And then when he was done, he went back to the airport, took the airplane back to Wisconsin where he works as a computer anal anal analysis. And he says that he did not visit the beaches of Hawaii at all. <laughs> That's how he was focused upon his task. Now, if you ask him, why do you do this? This is what he says. People should be out doing something rather than just existing or surviving. Even if you think that what I'm doing is meaningless, it is a purpose at least. If the store closes before I visit it, I would lose another piece of my soul. And I, I'm thinking this and I, I'm partly admiring him, maybe 5% admiring him for his uh, persistence and passion, his grit. But the other side of me is, oh man, <laughs> What, what in the world are you doing wasting your life because his top level goal is nowhere near worthy of the time and the money that he's spending. I believe the kingdom of God is worthy of investing our total lives for us simply because that's what Jesus did. It was worthy for Jesus to do. And so I believe it is a worthy goal. This is Jeremy Tree. Uh, by the way, uh, the Kingdom of God theme, it, there's floods of books coming out right now. They're all over the place. And this is one of the many that's come out in the last year. In fact, this is his second one. Uh, and I, I love this uh, quote. It says, if you focus more on being successful than on rightly defining success, then it won't matter whether you succeed or not. And I totally agree. And this is from his first chapter because he's trying to get the reader caught up into understanding what the kingdom of God, because he says the kingdom of God isn't really just one activity or another activity. The kingdom of God is the framing structure for everything that you do. I really like that. It's the framing structure for everything that we do. So this is the passage. I, I really be, believe that God gave to me um, you know, I, I joked in the beginning on one of my sermons that everywhere I turn, I see 633 and I still see it, you know, and I understand because I, I have it in my mind. Whenever I see it, my mind's going to catch it and all of that. I understand, but uh, give me a break here. I, I feel like God's speaking to me with this, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. And both personally and in church life, I, I really... I uh, want this verse to come alive. And obviously we have to understand what the kingdom of God is to seek it properly. And the last point, almost done. Oh, sorry, last point. Um, the kingdom of God is a complicated topic. And I, I shared that briefly. It really is a complicated topic. And I'm still struggling with a number of different issues here. But I'll just give you one illustration of this complication. This is a Luke in the same gospel, right? So Luke 17, Jesus speaks as the kingdom of God is here being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed. No, where they say, look, here it is or there, for behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. It's already here. Why are you looking into the future? It's already here. And then in Luke 19, this is just two chapters later, uh, the kingdom of God is coming. So verse 11, as they heard these things, he proceeded to tell a parable because he was near to Jerusalem, because they supposed that the kingdom of God was ready to appear immediately. He said, therefore, a nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and return, because they all thought the kingdom would be coming immediately. And he wanted to tell them a parable to so that, no, it's not coming uh, immediately, but it will come in the future. Now, how do you put these two, that the kingdom of God is here and the kingdom of God is coming? So, you know, in theology, we have this phrase, already, not yet. The problem is how much of it is already 
and how much of it is not yet. And then what parts of the kingdom is already, but what parts are not yet. So you get all of these different variations of views just from these two, but it's not just kingdom of God, it's timing, but the relationship between the kingdom of God and the cross of Jesus Christ. What's the relationship there? Oh, it, you, it, it splits into a number of different areas how to understand that. And then the gospel. How do you understand the gospel that our, our sins are forgiven, as we saw, redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, First Peter, and yet at the same time, it's about the kingdom of God is at hand. So uh, what's the difference there? And is the kingdom of God the church? I, I believe the kingdom teaching has uh, applications for the church, but is it the church? Well, I, I, I don't know. There are different views on that. And then when we talk about the kingdom, it's hard to separate it from Israel because Israel was uh, uh, the kingdom of priests uh, for the nation that is set apart by God. And uh, is there a future for Israel? What is the kingdom in relation to Israel? Is there still hope for them? Uh, you have a bunch of that. And then uh, the land, you know, kingdom of God is about the king, it's about the rule, but it's also about the land. And how do we understand the land today when the church is not a political institution? So we don't have land, we don't have laws in that sense. And so we have all of these different issues with people on differing sides. And so, you know, I will share options as we move along, but I, I don't want to spend too much time or this would, it, it would stretch it out too long and not all of you would be interested in all the diversity of views. So I'll briefly mention it. And if you're interested, I can send you to sources, but uh, in general, I'll present where uh, I am falling in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, the different questions and issues that arise. And so uh, uh, that's it for me today. I just wanna, uh, and for every session, I wanna try to keep it about half an hour and then set aside maybe 15 minutes for questions. So that will be done at 12 uh, every uh, Sunday will be done at 12 and then we can go and have lunch. I, I don't know if there are questions at the moment for uh, an introduction. If there is, I mean, we can talk about it. Uh, and as well, you can always send me emails uh, in between uh, during the week. Well, I, I, you know what, I was expecting less than 10 people today, especially because a lot of people are at, uh, not a lot of, but the streaming team is out there and they're working on different things. But uh, uh, thank you so much for joining uh, today. And uh, I trust uh, that God would bless us. And yeah, and let me close the, this first session in prayer too, because I, I really want this to be not just theological uh, and not just understanding Bible texts and answering difficult uh questions, but I want it to be life-changing. I want my life to change through this study and process as well, and for the church too. And so let's just pray, and then I can close. Father, we, the more I read your word, the more I see how rich it is and how feeble our minds are trying to wrap it around all that you have to say from Genesis 1 to Revelation 21. And Lord, when we come to a theme like the kingdom, your kingdom, Father, and all that is said about it and all the events and its implications, not just in biblical times, but in terms of the church uh, in America and in the third world and China, everywhere, Father, as well as our personal lives. Father, we want to live a life that is worthy of the blood that was shed to redeem us from a fruitful way of life. And, and my heart goes out to this Lorenzo gentleman who's so passionate about something that I think personally is a waste of time. But then, Lord, I, I'm not quite sure I have uh, attempted to live out my life with the same degree of grit for your purposes as well. And so in that sense, I'm a little bit ashamed. And I pray that as we study the kingdom in the next few months, that you would refocus, cause our hearts to be uh, impassioned and emblazed about what this is all about so that we may 
stand before you one day and that we would have been faithful about the right things. Don't allow us to be simply successful, but help us to be successful about the right things, Father. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you everyone for joining today. It is an absolutely beautiful day. Go out and enjoy and have a good lunch as well. And so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. God bless.